So thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation uh, for today. Um, and for me, it is a great honor to talk to you, and it is a very special event. And um, I'm very proud and happy whenever I can have a discussion with you. Uh, I'm a Hungarian, and I believe that you really understand the Hungarian cultural background and and i feel the same way that even though i understand hungarian culture but i also very much embedded in the german culture and actually at this point maybe i should show this book to the audience i received this book from you and it was uh, it, it's about a uh, love and and the marriage of your parents. And there are some lovely pictures in the books. For example, here you can, um, you, you can, we can see your father with the, uh, your two siblings and yourself. Hans von Dochnani was your father. And, and the Nazis uh, killed him, as we know. Um, because he was in the resistance and there was actually another picture i also have some personal connections with here you are um with your grandfather on this picture in front of your house and a couple of years ago when um in the honor of your grandfather we commemorated we had a commemorative event I remember that I was able to meet some of your family members uh, and uh, also some students of your grandfather because your grandfather um, taught them uh, piano and they were telling me stories about um, these beautiful memories they had of your grandfather as a piano teacher but now let's just move on to another issue but maybe i should start um with a question actually in this question my major consideration is as follows history and historical events to what extent these uh, the, did these historical events have an impact on your approach to politics so the german politics and german past german history to what extent did it form your opinion and um germany Germ germany first of all i'd like to start with a thank you because even though you are much younger than me, of course, but I would say that those in my generation who are still alive need to be aware that they are responsible uh, for keeping this very deep relationship between um, Germany and Hungary um, alive and you have done a lot for this and i remember very clearly when you served as an ambassador in berlin berlin we met several times and you made sure that you organized lots of events and we had a lot of discussions at these uh, um, events and of course my family um, in my family there were lots of musicians and composers and uh, and my grandfather has a lot of beautiful memories of Hungary. And I believe that you also wanted to make sure that we keep his memories and his uh, work alive. And uh, I would like to thank you for that. So by the way, the German history is, of course, very different from the Hungarian history. In Germany, uh, um, history actually imposes a huge problem my impression is and obviously and there are some proof for, uh, proofs for it that in germany as a result of the holocaust and the responsible we need to bear as a, a nation um, has a huge impact on how we think of course a, a lot of people had no direct uh, impact on what happened in auschwitz but uh, the germans as a nation's um need to take responsibility uh, when hitler took over the power in 1933 that represented a huge 
cut-off day or cut-off year in the German history. So I believe it obviously shaped us and much more so than the German, uh, than the French or the Span, uh, Spanish or the British uh, history would have formed their nation. And in my own personal life, what I could see is that uh, so much has changed and the approach to um, the nation has changed so much. Even the, our national anthem was rewritten in my lifetime. So these are huge events and that shaped me and shaped our nation. And I believe that the natural nation uh, uh, and national consciousness is a bit difficult when it comes to Germany, how we interpret it, how we live it. And you have also done a lot for the eastern part of uh, Germany after the reunification. And if I just think about those times again, and I remember that on the 30th anniversary of the reunifications, um, speakers at, the, at various ceremonies often uh, refer to the fact that there are still relatively large gaps between the former Western and Eastern Germany. Well, and it's an interesting question, a question what the reasons are for that. Is it history or how history shapes both parts of the country, how people socialize? So why are these differences still there? Or maybe it's not even true. Do you agree with this statement that there are still there is still a huge gap between the two parts of the country? Um, and if you agree, why? So, well, I think a lot of people had very different experiences in the past many decades. And, uh, and of course, people um, experienced the um, newly found freedom differently. Um, the old um, uh, uh, counties uh, such as Turingen um, and Sachsen and so on, um, they made very different experiences after the war from their Western counterparts. Western Germany had a second chance, basically, after the World War to build up a new society, a new economy, and they actually used it very wisely. And and all of a sudden, in the eastern part, very suddenly, this opportunity also opened up. But the difference was that it was almost a shock because it was so sudden, so quick that they had all of this freedom um, compared to the gradual in introduction of a freedom on the western part. But if we just look at, for example, Span um, uh, the Spain and the, re the relationship to uh, Catalonia, then we can really see see uh, some similarities. Um, so I think that is um, one of the reasons for these gaps. And another reason is that there are also just clearly economic differences, no question about it. Um, larger global companies or uh, larger co um, um, concerns don't tend to be settled down in the eastern part. Berlin, before the war, was an industrial center, but it's not the case anymore. And all these large companies that were back then before the war may have been present in the eastern part are not there now and actually um in 1991 i wrote an article about this very issue namely um the various or and potential economic locations and and locations for multinational companies to resettle in the eastern part of germany um and in my article also mentioned that and that before the war, actually, the eastern part was a uh, much stronger um, in um, in terms of the economy. But of course, in the in uh, after the war, it all changed. And of course, that had a huge impact on the population, both economically, but also socially. And that's a huge problem at the moment in Germany. If you just look at other countries where there are regional differences, but maybe not that 
present, but still there are regional differences. And what we can see there in these other countries that it takes quite a long time to mitigate them because they are often very deeply rooted. Um, the German government has uh, an officer uh, responsible for the eastern part of Germany, and he just recently made a, a statement uh, referring to a mental deficit and in socialization, and it was quite controversial, and um, that and he also mentioned that the RRT party, um, alternative of the Deutschland party, is um, so popular in the eastern part of Germany. So I think a lot of people don't really understand um, this statement. I definitely disagree. I don't think that this was, uh, this is really the reason that this party is so popular. I think the real reason is, especially in the work, work, uh, working class, is uh, the fact that they are the ones that are mostly impacted by globalization, and that shapes their political views. Um, is so. Um, this uh, right wing or extreme right uh, extreme right uh, wing party uh, popular um, in the eastern part of Germany uh, after the wall came down there was a huge social economic pressure on some layers of the uh, of the society and a lot of people are very upset for example today about trump who is not a very um, attractive man so today but we mustn't forget that he did identify a lot of very important issues um, for example globalization basically left a lot of people behind especially working class and that's something trump clearly talked about and if we just really look back a couple of years we can really see that it really is the case and and there are a lot of uh, studies that clearly try to um, point out that um, there is some sort of an anti-globalist feeling that popularists will actually use and capitalize on. And that's exactly what Trump did as well. And I can imagine that there are a lot of differences um, in the society. And of course, it makes um, the society split into to winners and losers, and especially in the new um, counties in the um, eastern part of uh, Germany, that is a good breeding ground for right extremists. Actually, I used to have some contact with a large um, industrial company. Um, um, and when uh, this company had to be closed down, I don't really want to sound too full of myself, but maybe I should really point out that that was one of the best privatization um, he, uh, stories in Germany. Anyway, um, what we could see there that only 30% of the jobs were capped, and that was already exemplary. And that puts me into this whole context of globalization that um, um, when we think that the whole um, uh, reunification was great for the Eastern Germans, then we are wrong. And and uh, there is a reason why um, some people are disappointed and now uh, feel more attracted towards the extreme right wings. And, and on the one hand, those who vote for, for our, uh, AFD, so the right extreme parties um, often justify uh, their votes 
or their preference uh, by saying that it uh, it is because of globalism and often political experts they just say oh yeah it doesn't matter it uh, and there are some silly people but no there is a very clear a clear trend that we need to take seriously and political experts political analysts often oversimplify this situation and I must say uh, that uh, often these political analysts don't realize that the, these people are just as much part of the German society as anyone else. So what we can hear from Trump, as much as unattractive it might sound, we must remember that a lot of people think similarly. So we need to think about solutions here. And in our political discourse, I can't really see any feasible solution just yet. Of course, I'm talking to a Hungarian gentleman now, so you're well aware that in 2015 and 16, I wrote an article or, uh, on Hungary um, and I, I wrote this article because back then I had the impression that Hungary is criticized quite heavily and obviously uh, the government of uh, Viktor Orban is criticized very heavily for various reasons, but often these criticism don't consider the little nuances, the little pieces of the puzzles that uh, creates the entire uh, picture. Um, and of course, um, the roots are very different from, let's say, the from the, the Dutch. And um, and um, we mustn't forget that Poland is also referred to similarly quite often. Or I could also take Denmark as an example, because um, Denmark would like to have a refugee camp, busy, uh, um, camp pushed outside their borders. So anyway, but um, every country has different histories that are shaping their way of thinking about politics, and that has to be considered when we analyze. So. Going back to the issue of the AFD, they are basically Nazis. Obviously, you are not supposed to have a correlation with them, but you can still have a discussion with them because I think the questions they are raising are valid. And I think uh, um, having a discussion is being brave and it's important to be open to understand the other parties or other politician's way of thinking. And if you're not brave enough to have these discussions, then we miss out on some real important questions. And of course, um, in Germany, what we call political correctness is, is uh, very important, but that also means that it narrows down the communication, political communication channel, and often it uh, uh, doesn't enable us to talk openly about issues. You can't um, exclude people. Of course, Nazis have to, have to be isolated, but still it's important to have a discourse. Uh, we have to make sure that we try to uh, analyze the opinion of everyone. Yeah, very interesting. I obviously um, um, listen to the listen to the news and, for example, ZDF uh, channel. But I have the feeling that your opinion uh, is more the minority. Yes, you're right. Um, I do represent the minority with my opinion. Well, how would you explain this? This simplification pressure, so to say, what we can see in the public discourse, in political analysis, that the political um, communication is just so oversimplified. To be honest, it's just so painful to watch um, also in the German media. Well, 
I, I believe that it is due to the fact that people are not brave enough to stand up for their opinion. I need to quote Otto von Bismarck in this context. He once said to one of his friends, you would be surprised, but in Germany, the tradition is that that we um, that we go uh, on into the war, we we do battles, but we don't really tend to share our opinions with others. Well, Bismarck said it over two hundred years ago. So. Um, um, delivering your opinion freely, that means that you're independent. And to be honest, I have also been criticized personally several times for my opinions because there is this very um, narrow channel, this political correctness channel. So what we can see all over the media is that Orban is just a bad person, really naughty, and that's it. But that doesn't bring us any forward. We need to understand his whys. Um, um, at the weekend in Sachsen-Anhalt, that is obviously a small county, will have elections. And at these kind of elections, I think we can already have a bit of a feeling for the national elections. Um, I think um, the CDU will have the same coalition, most probably without the AFD. Um, that's also my estimate, but that's what the polls say as well. So, um, and um, concerning the Bundestag's uh, elections, um, well, there are lots of uncertainties. One thing seems to be certain, namely that uh, Chancellor Merkel will not continue. Well, how would you evaluate the the past uh, years of um, Angela Mar Merkel? Well, this is a really difficult question because obviously um, I was part of it as a contemporary um, uh, political analyst. I think Germany was led very well in the past years by a woman who was able to use his her female qualities uh, very well and very wisely. Uh, Gerhard Schröder, even though I do respect him, but he was more uh, of a, um, a soldier almost, and that was his way of governing. And uh, Angela Merkel was a scientist. Uh, she is very analytical. She um, uh, she was a, a researcher in the field of physics, and she understood that she needs to have the facts first before forming an opinion. And that really made her a very successful chancellor. And also outside Germany, she has always been quite highly respected. Well, inside Germany, she did have some um, um, critical uh, views, for example, that she wasn't very willing to make compromises. But I think um, a female leader uh, um, is something very positive because she combined her female qualities with her very rational fact-based approach. And if we just look back, obviously she also made some mistakes, but every single mistake she made can be explained. So, but all in all, I think it was a successful period of time. You mentioned that um, Mr. Schroeder was, well, um, a bit um, of a soldier politically, but also he is a bit naughty. You refer to him almost like that. Um, um, but um, um, when Schroeder stepped back, it was rather strange to see that in the field of political culture, something really unique happened. So um, Schroeder had the Agenda 2010, which was an economic reform that he introduced. Basically, that 
caused his own political suicide and he basically paved the path for Angela Merkel. Uh, Merkel. Well, I just partly agree. Uh, he did make decisions that he was aware would make him unpopular uh, within the party. I think as a politician, especially as a high level politician, that's part of the deal. Sometimes you're un, uh, unpopular and he made some, mis uh, some decisions that were important. But what was the mistake he made? That he decided to have elections in Germany um, the experience made in the 1920s in the Weimar Republic was that back then what Germany well needed but well, so but anyway that the Chancellor had to step back if they lost the majority that was the rule back then but that's not the case anymore so what we have now is that when the governing party or the Chancellor um, loses majority, uh, then they don't necessarily have to step back, but the parliament has to vote whether or not they can still uh, trust this uh, uh, politician and should have lost uh, 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 he, uh, seven of his most important allies. And I remember asking him, why are you stepping back? Why are you doing it? You don't need to. Also, with a minority government, you can um, carry on governing. Um, and um, But um, he, he decided for having an election. So in 20, uh, so back then, I think it was completely unnecessary. Uh, I had the feeling that Schroeder wasn't really quite aware of the constitution and he didn't actually use the constitution for his advantage. It was actually quite interesting. It is really simple. He just didn't use the constitution for his advantage. Well, a new chancellor can only be um, be elected if the parliament has a majority. Um, there were seven people back then uh, who left um, the SPD, the Social Democrat fraction, uh, at the time, but they would have never voted for uh, Angela Merkel at then, never. So, so um, he didn't have the majority, and then he decided to have an election and he lost by not much actually but he did lose but i believe if someone is a chancellor they need to be fully aware of the rules of the constitution he just made a mistake there mm, yes no, actually, I do want to talk about the various parties, but actually, I really want to get back to um, um, Chancellor Merkel. Many people criticize her because in every single coalition she formed or she was for forced to be participating, the position of, uh, of the CDU was often um, given up. And and maybe that led to the strengthening of the AFD. Um, obviously, issues in the field of migration or uh, or nuclear energy and lots of quite controversial issues. Uh, what she was criticizing, uh, criticize. And as you mentioned earlier, she is a scientist, and that makes her wise in a way, but maybe at the same time, it was also, well, her limitation because often maybe it distracted her from a, from the political value of her own party, because often it's difficult to combine political values and um, facts. Well, I disagree. So if someone gets married or forms a coalition with another party, you need to be quite strong. Um, you can't, um, you only have a coalition because you can't, uh, um, you can't uh, um, have a government with your uh, party. So you, and just similarly to a marriage, then you have to make some com uh, compromises and, and, 
um, she was involved in um, the discussions of uh, nuclear energy. And a couple of weeks, uh, days ago, uh, I had a Zoom call um, in connection with Fukushima, and we had a discussion what happened there. And I believe that back then, uh, the Greens um, said that we have to phase out nuclear energy by 2022 and CDU wanted to phase it out by 2035 or actually that was the coalition's position. So that's quite a big difference of uh, 13 years and Chancellor Merkel was quite uh, reserved expressing uh, her opinion on this and well it does matter if the phasing out ends in 2022 or 2035 and I believe that we had so many other issues so many other problems and that's not that wasn't just the main issue I believe and uh, and what we should have uh, thought that uh, um, uh, um, um, so how, how shall I say that we should have just realized that there are so many areas we need to uh, focus on um, and that means that some areas that seem important now had to be um, uh, pushed aside. Uh, Mr. Hubrecht uh, actually was also um, for phasing out nuclear energy and um, and there were actually I would say there was a general consensus on that the basic principle was that if we have to um, if as a starting point we can take that we have to have renewable energy the only way to proceed is to basically put the energy industry under pressure and uh, if we want to phase out nuclear energy we need to think ahead and we need to think about alternatives um, uh, for example renewable energy and as i mentioned i've just had a meeting a couple of days ago on fukushima um and uh, and uh, then I said, obviously, retrospectively, that maybe it was a mistake. Maybe, maybe what we should have done is to maybe we should have extended um, the phasing out period. Maybe we stopped a bit too suddenly, too quickly. Maybe there could have had some better option to also uh, utilize on renewables then because then we would have had more time to uh, to think about the best solution so i'm not quite sure but i have some doubt so anyway i do not believe that angela merkel gave up her own principles i think she was just doing politics cleverly BASF, which is at the same time the largest electricity consumer in Germany, they also agreed with that. So, and you touched upon another issue, migration. Obviously, lots of refugees arrived to Germany via Hungary. And that was all horrible. And obviously, Budapest couldn't do anything about it because they all came from the Balkans. And the question was whether or not to open the borders or we should just not and of course um, this issue could be answered in so many ways and actually I agreed with her decision at the time and I, I, I still do uh, and uh, and Denmark and also Viktor Orban says that if we want to have a normal um, migra migration politics um, implemented in Hungary then we have to start it with our borders however it is difficult um, so what did Merkel achieve, now referring to the agreement with Turkey, um, um, at least some of the refugees or potential migrants did not 
come to Europe, they stay there and they are provided for in Turkey. So that was an agreement she made. Of course, we can discuss it. There are some articles um, uh, of the opinion that um, uh, um, Merkel just forgot everything that she believed in in the past. But I don't think so. I think it was a moral decision. Uh, at the time, and maybe uh, it wasn't quite um, clever to be so over enthusiastic about it because the refugees or migrants were very uh, welcomed at the time. Uh, but um, also, um, I believe um, is if you and that if we want to help someone, uh, we have to do it uh, with joy. And we mustn't forget that's also in the Bible. And Angela Merkel is uh, the daughter of a priest. And I think um, that was an expression of her Christian beliefs. And um, Angela Merkel is um, um, is very committed to Christianity, and she often talks about it also in private um, interviews. And and therefore, I believe that she actually did follow her principles, her Christian uh, prin uh, principles. Um, um, I would be very pleased. Uh, if this kind of biblical quote would be um, present everywhere. Oh, may I interrupt you before you go on? Well, I think we are in a situation when we are, we shouldn't talk about reformed uh, Christianity um, or Catholics at all. No, we should talk about Christianism as a whole. We shouldn't always um follow all these divisions um and of course um christianity is also struggling and the uh, and the catholic church is struggling at the moment for example of all the pedophile um scandals and i believe that we need to really realize what the real issues are um we and the Tribontek uh, was talking about Christianity's, um, Christianity a lot. And he said that he wants a non-religious Christianity, basically referring to all the dogmas that uh, the Catholic Church always tries to follow. Uh, and when we are talking about the Reformed Church, we must remember that it's again a division that we don't need we need to um, think about our christianity and actually also um generally i think we shouldn't follow dogmas we uh, we need to just follow our christians roots i would like to mention um, that on Monday we will have a conference where Kurt Koch will be one of the speakers uh, who is uh, responsible uh, for, he's a cardinal, and he's responsible for the unity of Christianism in Rome and in Vatican. And uh, I th on Monday, we will have a very interesting discussion with him. So um, I just wanted to um, make sure that the audience knows about it. But now, let's just look at the uh, left-wing uh, parties, your own party, the social, uh, social Democrats. How, so how would you um, describe the reasons for the success of uh, the Greens? Well. I would say it's also a question of fashions. Obviously, climate change and um, environmental protections are very 
in the now, so to say. Of course, they are also very important. Um, for example, we had uh, uh, Fridays uh, for Future, uh, the, um, that is a movement initiated by Greater Thunberg. So these are all very fashionable at the moment, and all the middle class uh, kids are uh, very enthusiastic about it, and they don't care how what sort of an impact it would have on the working class. So for them, it doesn't matter that it would have a huge impact on the automobile industry, for example. So I think that their followers, the followers of the Green Party, are normally rich kids. Uh, so, we, we, uh, for example, their voters have the highest income at average. Obviously, there is no doubt that we do need a new climate politics and we need to make sure that we um, address the challenges of uh, environmental pollutions and climate change. Also in relation to Fukushima, these are considerations uh, that are important and we need strategies for all this. Actually, um, this is quite an issue that we talk about a lot in Germany, maybe um, not so much in Hungary, but um, uh, um, when, uh, when we are talking uh, about climate change, um, we often say that we need to have long-term strategies um, uh, and we don't really have a plan. We don't really have a strategy. I mean, Greta Thunberg is not really a plan, not really a, st a, a strategy. They don't care what sort of impact um, certain environmental measures would have um, a sector, for example, but we need to see it holistically. And um, this is an issue that are discussed a lot in Germany. And to be honest, what I'm missing here is that that when it comes to the Green Party, they are very one-sided. They only have like one element in their uh, policies. Uh, but we mustn't forget environmental protection is something that uh, people are in increasingly interested in. And of course, they would say, oh, yes, I'm really interested in saving the earth because I want to keep the earth for my grandchildren. But that's not enough. And politicians, that like, that's a job, that's a profession. And um, it's not enough to be an activist. And Angela Merkel knows it. It's not enough just to throw some sort of an objective um, to um, people, uh, but uh, we need to have clear strategies. So even though, just to sum up my um, question, they are maybe doing well, but it doesn't mean that they will do well at the election. And what about SPD, the Social Democrats? Um, your... Well, uh, um, well, um, SPD, that's my opinion, of course, but I have been um, writing about it for years. And again, I'd like to emphasize is that what the socialists did not understand or social democrats, what they did not understand in these times is creating jobs. The Greens don't really care uh, about creating jobs. They want change in the environment. But the Social Democrats say, yes, we also want change, but at the same time, creating jobs. For example, there are certain things we can do um, uh, technologically, um, the carbon capture, for example. So um, we can, for example, reduce um, a carbon emission 
as a result that's what the chinese do now but why don't we in germany produce carbon uh, capture devices and we can just uh, give it to the police or the hungarians where there are a lot of um, power plants in germany uh, the decision was made that carbon capture devices cannot be built. So, but if you make decisions like that, where is it going to end? So, um, it wasn't actually at Bundes level, so national level decided, but some counties. Um, I believe that the Social Democrats would ha would be much more successful if they addressed um, this issue in such a way that it is a clearer message. They could say, uh, we believe environmental protection is important, but we want to change things in favor of the environment. But at the same time, we want to create uh, jobs, we want to protect the workers. And of course, for example, now oil prices are high up and um, that also uh, makes um, pri uh, prices higher because it also uh, increases petrol, uh, petrol prices. And those who, for example, live in the countryside and, for example, work in Hamburg and there is no other way for them to get into the, um, into the city but by driving. So for those people, um, then think about it a lot so that, you know, we have this increased um, petrol prices and what sort of impact I, it has on my life. If um, Angela Merkel is not a chancellor anymore, then of course that will also change Germany's position in Europe because with her very subtle dominant um, um, politics, she was a very important political player. You even experienced and witnessed the foundation of the European Union. So for you, it's quite interesting to see how it's changing. So how would you describe the changes since the foundation of the European Union all the way to now? Were the chances well used? What do you think? What are the problems or advantages? For about seven years, I was responsible uh, for the coordination of the um, European politics within the German government. Um, there were um, lots of um, areas I needed to focus on and um, and that were various areas, for example, healthcare or economy or whatever. But anyway, I had to coordinate it and we had to have a um, common position uh, which were presented to the Chancellor and then, of course, that was presented in Brussels. So from this perspective, I do have quite an um, experience in the field of the European Union and its institutions. I believe that we will have more and more problems because uh, uh, an increasing number of countries are criticizing Brussels, what they can offer. Um, Poland, Denmark, for example. For example, the European Parliament wants to take Denmark uh, uh, to the court because they want uh, to make sure that refugee centers would be located outside the borders of the European Union. So, and that would, of course, trigger huge debates. Um, when it comes to sovereignty, uh, that, of course, also triggers a lot of discussions in countries such as Hungary and Poland. Um, uh, and uh, there is a bit of a tension then with the European Commission. So often one might have an impression that the um, difference between Western and Eastern Europe 
uh, is very much present also in Brussels in the EU politics and and that would of course endanger the unity of the EU maybe we had too many dreams maybe these dreams weren't feasible well I will see um, I think after the German elections, when Merkel will not be such a dominant figure, uh, I will s we can see that that will be a new era. Um, we could also see it in the US. I mean, now this is a really new situation now because there was some sort of a political style. Um, uh, and Trump had his own interest, the Americans had it, uh, their interest, but now it all changed. And I think that's the sort of thing we can also expect. What we, But everything is quite up in the air still. But what is certain is that in Europe, we will continue to have discussions or debates on, on many issues and whether or not Brussels makes right or wrong decisions mainly and um, and for example there is a huge debate going on concerning the future of europe it's quite exciting uh, and of course is it optimistic or or uh, more of a desperation well um these sorts of debates have always been around. This is just one of those. So Europe has done a lot of step forwards. If you just think about it, where we came from 70 years ago, or I don't know how long ago, or if you look back to the 50s, I think we've gone quite uh, far. So from the Treaty of Rome or the, um, the Lisbon Treaty, I mean, these were all huge steps, of course, and they all brought our continent together. And these are steps forward. Okay, and what is your recommendation to make sure that Europe as a whole would have more competitiveness uh, against China or the US? So, well, I think we do need to take some steps that would go beyond um, national competences i believe that for example in the case of airbus airbus in 1969 1970s we based on the airbus example we could see what i mean actually um, i just had a meeting in berlin and um, airbus was fifth yeah, we were celebrating the uh, 50th anniversary of airbus and i was present and i pointed out what the success of airbus was that there was a very solid cooperation between germany and france so that and that is the reason why Airbus can be so successful. And that is the reason why I believe that cooperation is the key for everything. Uh, of course, with 27 member states, it's more difficult. But cooperation is the key. The Airbus uh, created a company that was so successful that even though the americans had a huge advantage and i remember back then when it was all funded people said oh we have no chance against the americans in the in, in the field of aircraft uh, production but they were all proved wrong because today um, airbus is just as competitive as for example Boeing. of course they also had some uh, well rather unsuccessful um, incidents but still um, as a result of a german french corporation we succeeded in catching up in an industry where we didn't have too much history and a corporation always means that sometimes people have to give up their own interest uh, for the interest of a community and we can learn from it we can learn from our mistakes and we can learn also from the success stories and it is um, something that we often fail. Um, actually, 
um, Germany had that in the 19. 70s and also Japan did that, learning from the mistakes from others. And now the Chinese do that. They can grow faster than anyone else because their starting point was where, where our um, results. So they could base their, for example, their aircraft industry on the results of Boeing and Airbus, and that, then they can do a huge jump. So just because we have some delays in whenever, in whatever industry, it doesn't mean that we can't catch up. We can. We just need to learn from mistakes. But but if we just, um, for example, say that we just want to always speak French, then uh, that, as an example, uh, that we disconsider the fact that everyone else speaks uh, English. So it's important that we must remember uh, to to understand what the play rules are. Um, we need to see how we can be successful then. If I understood you correctly, the uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, cooperation is important. I've heard so many, uh, so many times from Mr. Laschet, who is the candidate can chancellor for CDU, said uh, we want a different kind of uh, Europe. Yes, I understand, but what kind of different kind of Europe? Well, it is important to have some basic principles, uh, but also. Um, it's important to be less dependent in some industries, for example. Uh, we need to see what Europe we want to see in the future. I think, unfortunately, uh, we need to end our uh, discussion soon because, yeah, this hour uh, um, be spent quite quickly. I have a last question. In my introduction, I also refer to it already, and that we were very much impacted by America, America. And you live in Hamburg, which is a town where uh, people are very attached to the transatlantic trans relationships. So how, what do you think about the transatlantic um, relationships and its future? Obviously, there is a new government or new administration in America. And I'm not just talking in political sense, but also cultural political sense. because uh, there were uh, so many issues, for example, segregation. Is it possible um, to build up a transatlantic uh, relationship that we knew in the past? Is it at all possible or do we need to reorientate and do we need to then maybe find other allies, China and Russia, and then as a result to redefine uh, our identity? So the times uh, change, um, as the Latin also says, um, well, we need to wait it out. If I just look at the US, we can see that there is a huge gap also within the US. So the, the gap that was present in uh, during Trump is still there. The question is who is going to be more dominant in the political scene in the US, who is going to be dominating the political and economic structure in America in the past 100 years, we've seen so many changes and often quite sudden changes. And um, how shall I say it? Um, 
So from the culture perspective, there were U.S. presidents that were only focusing on the U.S. and did not care what is happening outside. So we need to always adjust to these situations. Thank you very much. I can't see any uh, questions. Seriously, I'm surprised. No questions at all. No, it seems that there are no questions at all. Um, hopefully, it's not a technical issue. But maybe everyone was just so interested in what you said that they just forgot to raise questions. No, you don't need to say all these at the end. Um, um, what I can see now is, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a question from Ambassador uh, Kraft. What is your opinion of the development in Russia? It's a bit difficult to say. What I can definitely say, Russia has always had um, um, internal political issues ever since I have been involved in politics. They, they've always had some internal political um, tensions and debates. And this is a country that has a very special structure. Um, and it could be France or uh, Great Britain or whatever country. But we need to be aware of this structure in Russia. Um, in I don't think that in my life or in the life of our grandchildren will be changed. So the Russians are as they are. The same applies for America or uh, uh, the Hungarians. So Hungarians are as they are. We can't change them. And my opinion is and that, um, that, that, um, that, that times change and if Russia or America will change. We will adjust to that. We will change with the changes. And that's what the future politics will depend on. Actually, there is another question that is uh, uh, related to the gap between Eastern and Western Germany. And actually, at the end of our discussion, maybe it's really worth talking about it. Um, so there are, do you think that there is any way to change these uh, this gap? So what can we do to make sure that people will start believe and understand politicians? I think we need to continue to try i don't know if we talked about it earlier but anyway uh, in eastern germany there uh, there there are no large german um global company that would have their main seats or headquarters in the um in the eastern part of germany and uh, maybe we should um think about it that maybe we should have a much more targeted um industry policy uh, that would focus on relocating some of the global companies to uh, the eastern part of the country and i can imagine that uh, would have an impact on the entire country so for example when um, um, that um, Wolfsburg is, of course, the headquarters of uh, Volkswagen, and that will always be there. So it's a bit difficult to imagine that it would relocate. But um, I I'm sure that in some industries it would be possible. Um, uh, I uh, believed also in the times when Chancellor Korb was leading Germany that we should have had a, mo a much more focused, much more targeted industry policy. And, um, and if the uh, market is so strong, uh, as as strong as it was, then often the Eastern Germans have no uh, chance. So, well, actually, I wrote a book about it um, in 1990 about the industry policy of Germany. 
well um i think uh, there is um i think it it was one of the most interesting books uh, i've had i don't know what else i could say about this but anyway but i think um, that was a bit of a, a weak um, part of german policy thank you very much you said that chancellor mark uh, has qualities that that a lot of male politicians don't have. I think you are uh, also, you also have qualities not many have. I will be actually 93 in a couple of days, and that's a huge thing that I can still be so active and I can still think more or less. I would like to wish all the best to you and all to my Hungarian friends. I know I'm half Hungarian as two of my grandparents uh, were born in Hungary. I will never forget it. I'll always have a close relationship with Hungary and it has always been very important to me what's happening in Hungary. And I really hope that Hungary will succeed um, uh, to present the qualities of this very creative country and hopefully we'll be able to mitigate the tensions between the European Union and Hungary. Thank you very much again for the opportunity for this discussion. Thank you very much. Actually, thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you for your attention and thank you very much for the interpreters. Thank you.